the fantasy and the finer future. Thank you. Hello, everybody. How are you? It's good to see you today. I'm so glad to see all of you. And there are many who I think I would love to reach. And I'm glad you're filming this. Uh, I will put this up on my web page. And um, I was very moved to read uh, the collection of essays that Naomi Klein has put together for this exercise. Because realize the Green New Deal is a resolution of intent. It is going to require about six or seven different pieces of legislation to implement those concepts in four or five committees of different jurisdictions in Congress. There is one already in motion in the Energy and Commerce Committee. I believe it's already at 600 pages. So there is motion, but it's really going to require a tremendous amount of support from the grassroots up. And with the um, hope that giving you all who are grassroots leaders some material, some facts that will help to carry this message forward, not only about the urgency of our climate condition, but also the wonderful creative possibilities for change. So I'm going to talk about electricity from black to gold and begin with the, just the fact that we are in a climate emergency. We are facing the existential crisis of our time, not only from climate change, but also from global pollution, which is connected to it. And we have a wonderful living planet that we need to preserve. The Earth provides, fueled by solar power, everything that we need for our existence. Fresh air, the biodiversity of species, clean water, fertile ground. And these are the things that come to us for free as services from the living planet that we have as our home. And that planet is under severe stress because of human activities. Not only fossil fuel combustion, but resource extraction of all kinds, and the hyper-consumption mode of our own culture in America, and the increasing population who is adopting our way of life as a model. And we are looking at emissions profiles from transportation, electricity, and heat, industries and other fuel combustions, and then smaller ones from agriculture and waste. But the carbon dioxide picture is enormous. And so I want to focus on one of the largest contributors, which is the electricity production sector. Now, I know this looks like a spaghetti chart, but focus on one thing first. We used 101.2 quadrillion British thermal units of energy in 2018. Only 32.7 went to useful work. 68.5 was out the chimney as waste. And the chief reason for this large amount of rejected energy, of wasted energy from all of these fuels is the electricity generation process, which has only 12.9 out of 38 BTU, million BTUs going to uses in residential, commercial, industrial, a little bit in transportation. The rest goes out the chimney. And if you look at transportation, only 5.9 quadrillion BTUs goes to forward motion of the vehicle. All the rest goes out the tailpipe. These two technologies, the internal combustion engine and the Rankine steam cycle, were invented, when do you think? 1860s. People, it's time for an update. <laughs> we are still using major technologies of the Victorian age for modern times. It's time for a change. So this is not rocket science. We need to bring our critical systems into the 21st century. And it is a fantasy that we're going to do this on, on the natural gas boom. It has been touted as the bridge fuel of Marcella Shale. They're touting petrochemical complexes all up and down western Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia for the purpose of making plastics. And this is going to be the boom. Um, we just passed in our legislature House Bill 1100, which will subsidize this industry for another 30 years. The governor has promised to veto it. How many of you have already written your letter to him assuring him he needs to do that? 
Okay, that's your homework. Everybody, the minute you leave here, you send a letter to Governor Wolf saying, please veto House Bill 1100 because we cannot subsidize, subsidize fossil fuels for another 30 years. That will subsidize this industry until 2050. That is all the time we have to fix this problem. So it's a bridge fuel promoted as the game changer, as the beginning in restoring manufacturing and security and energy independence. How does this work? And it is an industry that is built on special exemptions. The Energy Policy Act of 2005, uh, rammed through by Vice President Cheney in the back room of a back room without one public hearing, not one, adopted a series of loopholes that removed EPA authority to regulate hydraulic fracturing. It exempted this whole industry from the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Superfund Act, and many occupational safety and health administration provisions to protect workers. This happened in, you know, a, a, as part of the Energy Act of 2005. And the promise was for jobs, 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 jobs. This is um, Mr. Uh, Kenneth Broadbent, uh, Steamfitters Local 449, and he was talking about providing 1,500 Steamfitters jobs who are going to make, some of whom are going to make 100,000 a year, and that natural gas is going to be bigger than the steel industry 30, 40 years ago, and he says there's 50 years to 100 years of natural gas in this tri-state region. This thing is not going away. If they develop all of this, we will not have a living planet by 2050. There are 39 states where fracking is going on, 15 million people, and 172,000 oil gas industry, uh, mostly non-supervisory and mostly non-unionized. So they're not getting the $100,000 wages, and they're not doing tremendously well. And if we build out all of the gas that we have, um, this is the um, Matt Kelso's Hazy Future, Pennsylvania's Energy Landscape in 2045. He's talking about 583 billion gallons of fresh water diverted to the fracking industry, 131 billion gallons of produced wastewater, 386 million tons of sand brought into here mostly from Wisconsin and pumped underground, could be made into glass for solar collectors instead. 323 million pickup trucks traveling for traveling those roads, 45 million tons of solid waste and 798,000 acres of land that will be impacted by this industry if we build out the whole of the, re of the um, fracking. And this is completely contrary to sound principles of planning for going forward. I can't do a speech without quoting Rachel Carson at least once, and her precautionary principle says that underlying all these problems of introducing contamination to our world is the question of moral responsibility, responsibility not to our own generation, but to those of the future. We have to start thinking in terms of the complexity of this issue out to the next generation. And we have also to recognize that this whole industry is moving to the production of plastic, something that is already choking the globe with the effluent of that, of that industry and with the discard of that production. So we have, um, I, I'm not gonna read this all to you because you can all read, right? So we have um, a tremendous amount of plastic that will come from this plant that will be producing once used plastic packaging for the most part. There are pollution occurring at every stage of the fracking process, from the production, the spills, evaporation, all the way through to the truck traffic. And you also have tremendous numbers of carcinogens produced uh, that are known to be carcinogens that come from the effluent. Uh, and these have been well documented, even from the EPA. They can't avoid admitting that they occur. Um, whoops, help. No. Ah, okay, wait. <laughs> I hate this. Okay, thank you. Can you send this up? Thank you. Okay. 
And we also know that you have environmental degradation, short-term health effects, long-term health effects, and worker safety health effects that have been well documented. If you want to look at the uh, League of Women Voters Shale and Health Conference reports for the last five years, there is a compendium now about this fat of documented research papers identifying the health harms. And we're putting fracking facilities right next to children's playgrounds and residential areas in many parts of our state. This cannot be a good thing. And we are subsidizing this industry tremendously much. 1.65 billion in, this is just for one plant. All of these, um, all of these subsidies were given to just the Shell Appalachia plant. They're planning four or five more plants. So think about this large number of subsidies that we're giving to an industry that we need to begin stopping. It has also had a negative effect on property values in areas where there are pipelines and also where there are fracking facilities. This is um, a study in the American Economic Review in 2015. Uh, in a place where there were fracking, they saw an average annual loss for, for groundwater dependent homes, 13.9% decrease in value at the same time that homes that had piped water saw an increase in value. So the presence of the fracking in places where people depend on wells, which is a lot of Pennsylvania, um, they're seeing effects also in um, denial of mortgages and failure to be able to get insurance for houses because of the fracking operations that are going on. So we need to reframe the problem. The result is that we have, this is um, Amory Lovins. He says, we have a temporary aberration called industrial capitalism, which is inadvertently eliminating its two most important sources of capital, the natural world and properly functioning societies. It is incapable of meeting the challenge of these times to prevent life on Earth from slipping away. And if you have read any of Amory Levin's work from the um, uh, Rocky Mountain Institute and from his, um, his books, you'll see that he's been talking about this since the early 70s and is actually implementing many of the policies that you need to move in a different direction. We also need to recognize that consumers do not see the consequences of this action. The environmental damage to land and ecosystems, all of these things are not reflected in the price. And if you don't live right near them, they're also not evident. They're not real obvious. And it support the policies that we're practicing right now support environmental destruction. It doesn't count the harm. It only counts the, um, the benefit of the extraction itself. We also need to recognize that we are subsidizing an industry that's killing us. Twenty and a half billion dollars a year in direct production subsidies for oil, gas, and coal extraction, and permanent investment tax credits for oil, gas, and coal of 7.4 billion a year. There's only 1.3 billion a year to the renewable energy industries, and those have to be renewed every five years. I have a law student looking up where all of these subsidies and the other ones, the indirect ones, are embedded in the law, some of them going back to 1837. We're up to 43 so far. So we're building a counter list to the 95 burdensome regulations that Trump is trying to get rid of and saying we need to get rid of these embedded in law tax subsidies and, and under, underwriting for the fossil industries instead. Um, this is a really serious issue because unlike the uh, renewable energy subsidies which are in an appropriation bill as one line these are embedded in laws that will have to individually be changed in order to rescind them and some of them have stood for for just decades and it does matter because 98 percent of the operating coal plants are unprofitable if the environmental controls are updated and enforced and 50% of the yet-to-be-drilled oil and gas wells are not profitable if you assume $50 a barrel oil price, if they didn't have tax preferences. So we are actually holding up industries that would not otherwise be paying off. And even now, the shale industry, uh, which has been hailed as a revolution, has burned through a quarter trillion dollars more than it brought in over the last decade. It's been a money-losing endeavor.
and it is not doing well. The regular standard in Poor's is going up here, and this includes major electric utility companies, uh, uh, all kinds of high-tech companies, energy efficiency firms, solar firms. The oil and gas production and oil and gas service industries have been falling to 85% below they're where they were in uh, 2014. So most oil and gas companies will go out of business or get bought out. The successful oil and gas companies will be those whose managers embrace the clean energy revolution and develop alternative energy products. And that is what this is um, the Williams Market Analysis coming company um, is an industry and analytics source. What's going on here is the companies who are looking forward and seeing where the future is are investing in the renewable and sustainable technologies. And the ones who are not have not been making money. They're going down. So even on their own metric, they're failing. So if we're looking at a bridge fuel, and we're looking at a bridge from the extractive process to a circular supply chain, how do we do that? Our finer future a better future with better opportunities is something that we can build. It's here among us today, and we can expand on it. So the United Nations issued a gap report in 2019 um, for the uh, Conference of Parties, and it showed that we have a long way to go before we can reach where we need to be. Countries have failed to stop the growth in GHG uh, um, emissions, and the technologies are here and effective and have improved significantly, but they've not been embraced on a national level. And America is still on a per capita basis, the largest emitter, although China is quantitatively the largest. And our trend was going down until Trump got elected and now it's going back up again. And that's true in a number of places. So we need to start looking at how we can reverse this trend. If we want to have sustainability as our goal, we need to recognize that where we are right now, if you have a balance between economy, society, and environmental values, our system right now is driven by dollars. If you can make a buck, you can do it, whether or not it makes sense otherwise. If you can make a buck, it doesn't matter of who gets hurt. If you don't like the way you're getting paid, we've got five people in line. It's a situation where we have distorted the values of environmental and societal uh, health and well-being for the sake of the almighty dollar. And if we need to have a, re a rebalancing of the environment and society and the economy, we need to shift the emphasis away from dollars as the only metric that matters. Does that make sense to you? OK. All right. So we're not talking about a transition. We don't have time for a transition. We started that in 1978, and we were headed in the right direction for a while until the Tax Reform Act of 1986 and the market will fix everything philosophy that came in with Reagan. But we are looking at a metamorphosis. We have to go from being an eating machine devoted to getting fat to something that is sipping gently from plants and flying away looking at reproduction and creating finer, better things. We are looking at a metamorphosis, taking the resources we have today, reshaping them, realigning them to do something better, better, our sustainable future is not a state of deprivation. It is not a state of want. It is a state of a better balance between people and society, where it matters, where your community is what holds things together, not the dollar economy. If we're looking at sustainable development, I still like the Brundtland Commission definition of looking at meeting the needs of today's generation without compromising the needs of future generations. And we need to redefine the problem in order to do this. We receive from the sun over 10,000 times more energy on a daily basis than we need to use for our work that we perform with energy. 
these are flows of energy that are renewed constantly and refreshed by just the existence of the living earth. It's already distributed. Solar energy is reliable. Nobody questions that the sun is coming up tomorrow, right? Comes up every morning, whether you want to see it or not, right? And we have the technology to use it now. It isn't polluting compared to the coal, oil, and gas, and it is safe. So we need to replace fear. The fear of the unknown, the fear of moving into something different, the fear of not knowing the system, the fear of not being able to provide for your family, the fear of something new. We need to have a different way forward. Are you kidding me? Ah, okay. Um, we need to have a plan for a sustainable economy, not just the transition to, uh, from one place to another, but a plan that takes account of the needs of the workers and the needs of workers. And we have the options of moving to the green jobs economy. And a green job is one that has uh, jobs in businesses that produce goods and services that benefit the environment and conserve natural resources. That's in not only renewable energy, but regenerative agriculture and green chemistry to produce goods that we use from non-toxic and non-hazardous feedstocks. And in the green jobs economy, you will have more jobs than we have in the fossil fuel industries already. Solar industry alone has 373,807 jobs. Wind has 101,738. Even nuclear has more, but we only have a few jobs by comparison in, 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 uh, in the fossil fuel industries. And the cost of energy in the electricity sector is going down and down, so that now solar, thin film utility scale, and wind are both below gas combined cycle in many areas. And this is um, an industry publication, the Lazard Cost of Energy Comparisons. And this is the unsubsidized analysis. So it doesn't include solar subsidies in this, in this analysis. This is why many utilities are already moving to the new addition of uh, solar and wind and even uh, advanced storing advanced storage capacity because they see that the cost curve is coming down. It's been coming down rapidly for wind and for solar over just the last 10 years. So the cost is going down, the ability to use it is increasing, and they are not competing, gas and, gas and coal are not competing with this profile. So replacing the 1800s technologies with new and sustainable energy systems means that we need to focus on the work that we're trying to do and replacing the work with appropriate technologies instead and not just look at fuel switching. If, you, if you're looking at electrifying our uh, economy, we can look at ways to shift electric generation to renewables and add distributed and customer generated sources and increase the efficiency of the existing built infrastructure. And that's really important because things like uh, houses, you know, different residential buildings, we may not turn those over in 30 years. You're not con you think of the house you live in yourself right now, it's gonna be standing in 30 years. So we have to find a way to make those things that are already here more efficient, more effective, and viable in a, in a post-fossil world. So the, the sectors of the green energy field are renewable energy and um, the, the production of power by energy. I'm going to go through these quickly because she's telling me I'm down to five minutes. Six and a half minutes. Okay, so we have a huge growth surge in this sector of energy storage and advanced grid it has seen a 235% surge in growth in just the last, um, in the last year or two, 2016 to 2017. There's a lot of potential and much of this technology comes from money that was funding defense applications, which was declassified just five years ago. So a lot of the storage and battery technology that was developed for going to the moon was declassified recently. 
So selections of batteries and storage technology that didn't get chosen for the moonshot has been sequestered as top secret for 50 years. Well, it was just declassified two years ago. So that is one of the things that's spurring this tremendous surge in this technology because these things are now available for commercial application. If you follow the DARPA, Defense Advanced Re Research Projects Administration, you'll see that there have been a lot of commercialization grants given for storage and advanced battery uh, solutions. So energy efficiency, I'm going to go through these really quickly because you know what they are. And better choices in electric vehicles has tremendous number of high quality, good jobs. Lots of investment going into this sector as well, not just by, um, not by the government at all much, but by private industry and by private sectors. And in Pennsylvania, the coal, oil, and gas jobs are 43,306, and the clean energy jobs are 90,722. Okay, so these are, these are the kinds of jobs in the clean energy sector, grid modernization, energy storage, wind, solar, clean vehicles, renewable energy, energy efficiency. Doesn't even include regenerative agriculture, which is another whole sector of its own. I would need a whole hour if I were gonna tell you all that. Okay, and So um, technology costs are dropping, the demand is increasing, and there are more supportive policies emerging. Mamma mia. I, okay. 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 All right. And also, people say that clean jobs don't pay. Well, they pay more than the national average. But again, recognize these industries are mostly not unionized. And so this is what the general market in the face of all these subsidized fossil industries is paying. But imagine what will happen if we decide to actually value the jobs in these sectors for the value they contribute to our future well-being. You know, if you guys are union organizers, you got some work to do. <laughs> okay? And it does have um, a lot of different educational fields required. Um, high school or less, all the way up to bachelor degrees or higher. Um, and we have to be aware that the economic transformation cannot be left to the invisible hand of the market. The way things are is not priced to reflect the value of not burning fossil fuels, and there's too much entrenched um, subsidization of policies to distort the market. You don't see things the way they really are. And this was a pronouncement of the International Trade Union Confederation in Copenhagen. Corporations are the ones who benefit from our existing policies. There's my friend Charlie McAllister. The plan for a transition must include taking care of the workers, the pensions and benefits. If we can bail out General Motors and Goldman Sachs, we can take care of the existing industry workers and not leave them to fend for themselves again. And we have to look at community reinvestment. I spent all day Friday with the Turtle Creek Reimagine group. They came up with 15 projects that they would like to do in the Turtle Creek Valley in order to, um, okay, in order to um, accomplish a reinvestment in their communities. Imagine what we could do with $1.6 billion in any of your communities. So our status quo is bought and paid for. The oil companies get a big return on their lobbying investment, and this is why we have so little success in trying to change these policies. But we have pathways forward that will work, and the laws of nature are not negotiable. Climate change will happen, and our laws must change in order to accommodate a future that will provide a life of value for our children. And this is the United Nations Executive Director commentary on our behavior at the last UN policy uh, meeting in September. American policy is looking backward to a world that no longer exists. So we have to reverse that and take, um, take our way forward in a new direction. I ask you to visualize the children of 2050. It's only 30 years from now. 
My little niece, Anne, will be, 30, will be 28 years old. My grandchildren and my niece will be about 45. My son and daughter will be getting ready to retire. Where will you be in 2050? And what kind of a world will your children have? Right? I know where I'll be, <laughs> pushing up daisies. But we need to make a U-turn in our policy direction. We need to move from awareness to outrage because the path that we're on is headed the wrong way. We need to turn it down and articulate policy actions and build support for them in a way that will get us to a two degree to one and a half degree uh, level of our, of our temperature change. We have to increase the social pressure and, um, and make a mainstream um, movement for change. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna just ask you that this is not a technology problem. It is an ethics problem. It's a moral problem. And do we have to ask ourselves if we want to preserve the planet for our children and our grandchildren and their great grandchildren or not? That's all we have. Thank you. So um, any, yeah. So anyone who has a question, please raise your hand. Um, Emily is taking stack back here, and I will try to get the microphone to people who'd like to speak, so that um, everything's picked up by our technology. So. so if you'd like to speak, oh. raise your card up. Oh, raise your card. Emily, so she, she can, can see. This will go on my web page, by the way, so you can have it. Um, I'm grateful for all the uh, progressive laborers here today. But I, um, I'm, bec I, I'm becoming, I'm, be I'm, I'm how's, th how's this? I'm becoming more and more uh, convinced that the uh, the changes are much faster than even most of us realize. For instance, I've been reading um, that the amount of heat that is building up in the oceans is equal to hundreds, of, believe it or not, it's, it's impossible to believe, actually. It's, it's, it's something that's beyond understanding. Uh, hundreds of thousands times the amount of heat released by, uh, by, um, by um, um, Hiroshima bombs, by nuclear bombs. So this is every day. Every day the, the, uh, the oceans are getting much harder. The, the, uh, you did point out, you pointed out that the, the change is not just linear, it's going in a, in a, uh, in a bell curve. Exponential, And th yeah. th this sucker's going straight up now. It's going through the roof. And, and, and so the thing is, we don't have till 2030, as Greta Thunberg uh, thinks. Um, she, she's wonderfully, um, um, radically pro and actively pro progressive, but she's, she, she, I, I don't think she has, the, uh, none of us have the whole picture. None of us know what's going to happen, but it, it sure looks to me like the changes are going to be much, much, much faster. And they're coming now, this year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Patty, uh, everybody that knows us know we work very closely together uh, on a lot of this stuff. And, uh, you, and Patty knows my position that I think I everything that she says is is right on the button the question is how do we get from here to there and uh, in the short amount of period of time that we have and and i in my mind no matter how quaint and trite and cliche-ish it sounds but we need a, a world general strike and we need a revolution and uh, we need something that attacks 
the people, at the same time you're putting your positive thing forward, we need to withdraw our consumption from the banks, the financial institutions that are, are supporting this. And, and lastly, Patty, I wish you would address the question of the empire, because uh, without dealing with the question of uh, U.S. imperialism and the, and the empire, uh, the stuff that you're talking about doesn't bring the equality and the social and economic justice uh, that we need to see this thing through. And just to give everybody an example of two of the biggest places where the U.S. military has spent the uh, majority of their time and money, unbeknownst to a lot of people, is in the uh, Congo and also in Colombia. And uh, of course, we know about Venezuela. Well, uh, a lot of those places uh, have the only known and biggest uh, sources of minerals such as lithium and cobalt that go into solar panels. So talking about solar panels without addressing the empire question, how do you see dealing with that? And how do you see dealing with the financial situation and political component that we're up against to get us from here to there? First of all, we have to, um, we have to end Citizens United because we lost our country when we gave over control of our political process to corporations rather than individuals. And as long as you have multinational corporations in control of the policy decisions of major nations, whether they're ours or China or wherever, you are not going to get decisions that depend on the collective well-being of all people. And I think it is really important to recognize how deeply we have gone into that hole of corporate control of our policy direction. For the last 30, 50 years, we have had major policy decisions made for the benefit of a narrower and narrower band of corporate interests. And the public interest has fallen away so much so that we barely talk about the importance of maintaining public institutions, institutions like public education, like health care have kind of become things you have to scream and holler for, and they used to be things that we know that are rights of everybody. I know that people like to say that the government is invasive and intrusive, but government put to good purpose can do good things. And I'll give you one example. After World War II, the GI Bill sent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to college for the first time. And if you look at the two decades after that, some of the most amazing innovations came out of, this, out of this country as a result of the people who were given that opportunity to have education. Look at the production out of IBM and Westinghouse and General Electric. A lot of things that came forward came from that kind of leavening of the, of the country by education and shared education to people who had never had it before. I think we're in that kind of a moment where we need to unleash the creativity and the innovation that comes from people in our country at the very roots. And if we do that, and I can tell you this, because I've been to eight reimagined sessions all around this state, into Wheeling, West Virginia, into Ohio. If you tell people that you have the power to recreate your own future and imagine what it would be like from the bottom up, people have wonderful ideas, amazing ideas, for what we can do instead of a fossil fueled economy. What we need to do is to empower that capa capacity, fund it, and don't tell me we can't fund it. If you can give $1.6 billion to Shell Corporation, which is a multinational institute, we can certainly fund communities to recover and rebuild. is that they would rather um, go bankrupt so they can just shed all of their re responsibilities of cleaning up. Some and of them so, will. Yeah, <laughs> and so my question really is, is where can we go with that? What, mm -hmm. How do we stop that? I mean, if there's, what, there's some gas company right now recently that's gone around and bought up a thousand or more gas wells and we're telling them they only have to clean up 10 a year or some ridiculous mm -hmm. number. And I mean, it would, they're not gonna be around 100 years from now to clean up all those wells. No, and that's some of the, some of the in businesses and, and jobs in the clean economy are involved in cleaning up the mess. But the people who made the mess should pay for it. And 
when the bankruptcy court settles out right now by law, they, un they write off. They write off. They write off. That law can change. That requirement can change. And you can send away from subsidizing, subsidizing those companies to requiring them to use their, you know, largesse, their profits, their accumulated wealth to pay for the cleanup that they have caused. Um, and I think to write the laws over so that any new industry has to begin by cleaning up and having a plan for neutralizing its effect on the environment, this is really important to do. Uh, we are still paying, in, in our state, we have over 3,000 miles of contaminated uh, rivers and streams from acid mine drainage from the last round. Who knows how long we're going to be taking or trying to take salt out of the groundwater from the fracking nightmare. You know, so we have to begin by recognizing that it's not only a problem but a huge expense, allocating the, cro the proper authority for who has caused that problem and making them clean it up. There is precedent for this in the Superfund cleanup process where you can track back to legacy companies and they're liable for the cleanup of uh, toxic spills. Uh, so we have a precedent in law for that. Thanks so much, Patty. Um, first of all, in the spirit of the red line and acknowledgement from earlier, I think, oh, sorry, I think it's really important that uh, while I agree the GI Bill was great policy and proved the power of government to, to do good in folks' lives, we have to also remember the enormous racial disparities in yeah. its implementation and execution. Um, right. But my question is this, you know, I'm no capitalist, but let me play devil's advocate for a second. You said the invisible hand of the market couldn't solve this problem, but you also suggested that industry estimates themselves suggest that in a no subsidy world, the per kilowatt hour cost of renewable energy is about half that of fossil energy. If that really, if we were to remove all the subsidies and just let it all play out, yeah. wouldn't the market substantially address the problem? I mean, who doesn't want to chase that kind of problem? Right. The market that it, as it exists right now is heavily skewed, but if you were to take all the subsidies off of oil, gas, and coal, and nuclear, those bars for those industries would ship very far to the right. And the, the utility industry is really pretty much a dollars and cents crowd, and a lot of them are public regulated, more than half of them. So when they see objective numbers in um, new solar, new wind is cheaper than new gas, they have been moving in that direction. Um, and also, when you define, and this is a new regulatory arena, but when you define utility um, rate base, what they can invest in as storage, um, intellectual um, artificial intelligence for leveling load between people who are making as well as using power, and adding the whole concept of renting the tops of your customers' buildings for solar as utility plant, then it opens this arena even wider. And as I said, this is not a fuel switching situation because for every, if one of the most effective things we could do in terms of a policy that would make a market would be to declare that the national building code for all new buildings in the United States of America would begin with a passive solar design with photovoltaic roofs. If you do that, you think about all the new buildings that are going up in the old way, and they're going to become a liability for the next 50 to 100 years. Whereas if you say they all have to look like the Forest Hills Borough Building, you know, which is a passive solar design with geothermal heating and a photovoltaic roof, we got a negative $2,581 electric bill for our first year of operation, net over a year. So we're making more electricity than we're using to power and serve all the functions of that building for a year. If every new building did that, if all the affordable housing complexes that go up were built on that model, the operating costs are less than half of the cost of a regular building. We could make advances on this system very quickly. But the market unfettered the way it is now with the distorted weights on it from the subsidies and the policy influence of special interests, you're not going to get there with that market operating on its own. We have to intervene and send it back the other way. 
I mean, regulation is a good thing if it's done in the public interest. All right, and this will be our, um, just due to time, this will be our last question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. Um, so I've been reading a little bit about um, think tanks and, and their effect on media and the narrative. And one of the things that I've been learning about techniques of fascism is that there's a real power play for the narrative. Mm -hmm. And our, your message isn't getting across. It is completely being overwhelmed by think tanks related to the Koch brothers and other think tanks that are dominating the narrative. So how do we begin to change the media concept and really begin to get a narrative that's powerful enough to promote this concept of the Green New Deal because we're losing as environmentalists. There's such a prejudice from the industry and what they're promoting in terms of media is horrendously false mm -hmm. and we haven't overcome that prejudice yet. How do you plan to well, do it? Well, anybody who has not written a letter to the editor, a blog, um, a, a letter to your legislator, um, talk to the interests in your own community, the businesses in your own community, finding ways to make it more visible, that we're doing good things now, we need to do that. We have to get those stories out there because these are the green job, the, the blue circles are the green job concentrations all around the country. This is not an isolated industry, but it isn't big enough yet to completely swamp. And as I said, did you know that there were three times more energy efficiency and renewable jobs in Pennsylvania than fossil jobs? How many of you knew that? You know, how many of you have ever seen that statistic on the radio? No. How many of you have ever seen it on TV? No. We need to make those things clear to people. And I know that we don't have the might of the Koch brothers, but we have the Heinz Endowments. We have the Pittsburgh Foundation. We have Public Source, which has covered a good bit of this. I think we just have to, you know, get loud. Thank you so much, okay. Dr. DeMarco. You're welcome. All right. I think so. Um, why don't you wait all okay. okay. So now we're going to take about a five minute break, give everyone a chance to stretch, get something to eat, go to the bathroom, and then we'll reconvene for the second presentation of the evening. <laughs>